uh, we are very happy uh, tonight uh, for another session of uh, Facebook Live with the scholars of Sud Ilahi. Tonight, we have a very special guest. Uh, it's none other than uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Shkwitama. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum Very well. Thank you, Sir Abdul, uh, Abdul Sufyan. Thank you. Alhamdul- Alhamdulillah, Sheikh. Uh, tonight's topic uh, is on self-growth and uh, ownership in pandemic times. And uh, we are also going to scope it a little bit to the topic of work excellence. But before we even dive into that, uh, I'll just read a little bit about uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Shkwitama's uh, bio. Right, so he's the founder and leading partner of Skritama Associates, a business and personal transformation consultancy based in South Africa, with franchises in Pakistan and Singapore. And uh, Sheikh Ibrahim is also a murid of Sheikh Mustafa Bashir from Morocco, the Tariqa Shazli, and now he continues the spiritual work from his Sheikh. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh, how are things over there in uh, Johannesburg? No, all very good. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Also locked down, but happy. Oh, so Johannesburg's on lockdown. Yeah. I just want to, uh, there's a slight uh, erratum. Um, we don't act, we've got a client in, in Singapore, but we, we don't actually have an operation in Singapore. We don't have a franchise in Singapore. I see. So you have a client in Singapore, but no, no franchise. Okay. Alhamdulillah, uh, Sheikh. Uh, tonight's topic, uh, we are going to scope it in terms of work excellence and also the idea of uh, self-growth and, and ownership. Um, perhaps in order to start, maybe we can try to understand. Uh, perhaps you can share with us, how do you define what self-growth really is? I, I think the... I mean, there's a, there's a number of angles that one can kind of use or perspectives one can use to explore the issue of what what does growth mean, but for me, the simplest is to understand that growth is about basically the maturation of intent. That fundamentally, as we grow um, and as we mature as human beings, our intent becomes more and more unconditionally about what we're here to give rather than what we had to get. So one can say that the process of maturation is concerned with the process of the maturation of intent to give unconditionally. So to grow means to develop your intent to give. Marshall, I, I remember you mentioned in your books, The Two Sandals as well, and also the Millennium Discourses, that it's, the purpose of life is more about giving and not really about getting. That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so with regards to this, uh, perhaps how would you define what having ownership is? Because on the point of view of an employee, let's say I'm working in a company, uh, they talk a lot about having ownership. Is it related to accountability and some form of responsibility? I think one can one can say that. I mean, I, I think in 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 most organisations, the real problem is how do you get people to get treated like resources to accept uh, some sense of of um, of initiative and accountability for the problem of the business. Um, uh, I mean, all enterprises suffer from that issue. I mean, the, the key tragedy is that we, 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 we seem to want to make that the employee's problem. I mean, we sort of say, you know, motivation is really about getting the employees on side. But we don't realize that actually there's a, there's, there, there's, there's a social contract that's being broken between boss and subordinate that actually produces the conditions where people aren't going to bring initiative to the, to, the, to the fore. They're not going to own the problem of the business because they're going to feel like they're being used by the business. Mm. So, so, so actually the problem doesn't lie with it, the, the, fundamentally the problem of ownership and of responsibility and of a sense of accountability doesn't sit with the people. It sits with how the business is led. This is universally true. So you mentioned that uh, it, it doesn't. It really sits with how it is being led in terms of how mm. the management is dealing with it. Well, what That's based good. on your experience? Uh, I mean, you own a consultancy firm on leadership and business. What are some of the good practices that those businesses have adopted? You know, to cultivate such a culture. So, um, if you're honest, it's kind of like so. So again, one must um, one must. One must be careful of the word practice because mm. the word practice has a behavioral pitch to it. And the, the, in fact, the, the problem 
of the, the, the diseased nature of the relationship with the subordinate in most instances doesn't sit at the level of behavior. I mean, most bosses these days have been to enough business schools to know that they shouldn't be rude with their subordinates. So it doesn't sit at a behavioral level. It sits at an intent level. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say, if you, if you want to cultivate people who are here to give, yes. have the intent to give, then as a boss, you have to have the intent to give. But in order to shift your intent, there's a number of things that you've got to get right, not in terms of how you behave, but what get right in terms of how you see the business. And then the first thing you've got to get right is you've got to stop seeing the business as some sort of a, as a system or a machine that makes money or gets a job done. Mm. You've got to see the business as a community of people who collaborate to serve. A business is a community. It's not a system. It's not a machine. Sure. And when you see a, a business as a community, then you understand actually that the critical problem, in, as in any community, is actually in a sense a political one. It is the loyalty of the people in the business to the people who are running the business. Just like the health or sickness of a city or of a, of a, of a country is the degree to which the citizen um, mm -hmm. is, is loyal to the leadership of that city. Now, you cannot be loyal to somebody who's leading you who treats you as a resource. I mean, you know, so, so, so along with this, this way of looking at running businesses, there's a whole nomenclature around um, business process, uh, human resources that are, yes. that are still part of viewing people as not as pe beings you're collaborating with, not as intelligent human beings you're collaborating with, but as um, variables that are subordinate to the system that you're using. Now, if you have that approach to your people, it doesn't matter how nice your behavior is with them. It's not about the practice. It's not about how you treat. It's how you're seeing them. You know, you, 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 you will not pull off a collaborative spirit between people who run enterprises and the people in the enterprises while the people who are running the enterprises are using the people who are in the enterprise. That, you know, that, that's illogical. Would you say, Sheikh, that the treating people in, a, in what you mentioned just as human resources instead of human beings... Uh, they, they tend to see people as cogs in the whole system. Yeah. Right. And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's, that's kind of, so, so, I mean, you, one must be very careful with how one deals with the subject because this is not, this is not sort of in the spirit of um, sort of a, sort of an outraged moralism. Mm -hmm. You know, we, Modern organizational thought is the product of kind of European thinking that has been developing since the Enlightenment, mm. which is this quasi sort of uh, scientific worldview. And so you have a discipline which is referred to as management science. Mm, interesting. You know, so, so now, now that already, if you, if you think about it, well, what's the framing? Yeah. That's a very mechanistic framing. I mean, it's not a community of people that get managed by a management scientist. <laughs> Do you understand? It's that kind of, yes. so, so there's, there's like, it's a deep language, is, which is the problem in our society, in our, in our civilization today. That, and, and it's that thing that needs to be challenged. You know, and it's, um, we need to go back to this idea that actually the business is a village. And, we, you know, we, we have to behave in such a way that all the citizens in the village are kind of recruited to the objectives of the village and aren't, aren't, aren't just feeling that they're being abused by those who are running the show. Michelle, I share, that's very interesting uh, what you just mentioned. In fact, I think uh, in many businesses, they kind of see people as a, as a, a cog, but also they will use even uh, acronyms to describe people. There you go. There you go. <laughs> exactly. In other words, you're no longer a person, you're a function. You're a functionary. You occupy a place on an organogram. You know, you kind of you get plugged in and you kind of you know. But now I want you to bring your human conscience to bear on the problem of our business. But at the same time I refer to you as a functionary, as a cog in the system. A cog in a system doesn't have volition. Mm. A cause a cog in a system does what it's told to do. It does what it's told to do, but unfortunately, then management won't expect them to do more 
take up more responsibility That's to deliver. The That's yes, the problem. Exactly. So, so, so management has this, the, the, this, this sort of enraged sort of uh, kind of. Uh, so you know, I mean, these people they just don't accept. They just don't take responsibility. They just mm. you know. Uh, but 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 uh, and and it's it's all seemed to be the workers' problem, uh, but not realizing that you've set the game up like that, Mr. Manager. Mm. You know you can't you can't expect your relationship with your subordinate to be nothing other than a negotiated trade of them delivering X value for the Y money that you're spending on them, and then expect them to be here to go the extra mile. Uh, uh, and to own the problem of your business, you know, because you know you're not treating them as collaborators; you're treating them as as as, as resources. Perhaps uh, some might even think uh, the only time the boss talks to them is because they want something from them. If they not they are not seen as useful, they don't even talk to them. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, that's so. So that's uh, uh, you've you've got it between the eyes. I mean, that's. Um, so, 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 I mean, I've, 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 in my consulting work, I very often come across somebody who'd say, that, you know, the senior manager came in here yesterday and started talking. What do you want? Why is he here? <laughs> <laughs> it's like the only reason why is to get something. I mean, is the possibility that the guy could actually be there because he's interested and wants to be helpful, that just okay. doesn't occur to people. You know? or, or they ask, did I do something wrong? That's why they're here. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with regards yeah. to this, uh, I mean, Sheikh, what if you are, let's say you are an employee and you are in such an organization and structurally, it's not something in, I would say in their power to actually change the management. What can they do to have better work excellence when they are in such a system? So, 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 I mean, this is, might sound like a complete contradiction to what I've just said before. But nobody can tell you what your intent should be. The most tyrannical boss in the world can't tell you what your intent should be. Your intent is always within you. And you always have complete autonomy over your intent. Mm. But then you must understand that when you construct your intent on the basis of either what's being done to you or what you're getting, which is kind of the same thing, Yes. What you're writing for yourself is a script of victim and misery. Mm. Because if, if you're here because of what you're getting from somebody else, they've got power over what you want, therefore they oh, have wow. power over you. Right. So if you want something from somebody else, their ability to withhold what you want makes you manipulable. If you decide to hell with whatever their intent is, I'm going to construct my day-to-day -day engagement with my workplace and with my life, never mind my workplace, on the basis of what I can contribute. And I'm going to be unconditional about that contribution. The degree to which you do that is the degree to which you are nobody's slave. You're no longer defined by anybody else, and you're no longer a victim, you're a master. So although we have a system which is biased towards making victims, we still subscribe to the program. Every employee does, because they don't realize that actually the, 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 the escape, the door is very, it's right here, it's close at hand. In fact, it's got nothing to do with the workplace, it's changing something in your head. Wow. I think that's beautiful, because it's an inward uh, revolution, and you actually uh, own that power in that sense, mm -hmm. rather than you become a victim. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, the thing is, the whole revolution has to be inward. Even, even in terms of the people who are running the enterprise, you know, they've got to say, listen, this way of looking at this enterprise, which is all just about what I'm trying to get out of these people, and you know, is suboptimal because I'm actually turning them, I'm actually entrenching a fundamental hostility between them and me. You know, mm, this yes. is not collaboration. This is um, animosity. You know. Um, I, I want a different relationship with these people. I can change my intent. So mm. that's the glory of the human being. Each human being can decide to shift their intent from what they're getting to how they can contribute. And the moment they oh, do yeah. that, they'll change their world. If, if people, owners of enterprises and people who run enterprises understand that, 
they will completely rewrite the social contract between them and their employees. From that day forward, they'll have loyal employees who will go the extra mile for them and shoot out the lights. But so the, the subordinate can do that. Anybody, everybody can do that. We have to overturn this legacy that we have, which seems to suggest that the only possible human intent is to be able to get something. Mm. Who, who, you know, by, by what rule in the world is that the case? I mean, surely, if you say that, that being yet to get something is possible, then it has to be logical, logically possible that you're here to give something. And in fact, if you look at the two worlds that you create, the, the world that you create when you commit to constructing your intent on your contribution is just so much more pleasant. Inshallah. Mm. You know, it's, it's just, it, it, it sets you up, in, in, for, it, it, you, get, you get success in two realms. You get success in the inward, because you then have a sense of autonomy over your life. And yes. you get success in the outward, because you then know, you transcend whatever the, the conflict is that you have with the world around you. you. You cultivate a sense of harmony with the world around you, you know? Yes. That's very beautiful, uh, Sheikh. Uh, you mentioned about harmony and intent. And I remember a quote you mentioned that uh, maturation is actually eloquence in loss. In other words, it's about how you can actually give rather than expect. And if you're always expecting to be given, you, you will be a victim and you will be depressed, no, maybe. No. In that sense. And you won't. You, so, so, I mean, I mean, this is not meant to depress people, but surely the product logically the, the 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 outcome of the journey of of maturing is that you die mm. you know and and i mean it stands to reason that when you die they don't ask you how big your bank account was i mean you, you're not you're not you're not asked how, you, you, you know how much can you are you getting here you yeah. ask how much can you lose absolutely unconditionally right now you can't take anything with you in other words death doesn't test your capacity to accumulate. Death mm. tests your capacity to lose. And insofar as death is inevitable, maybe you should start s studying for this examination. Inshallah. Because, I mean, otherwise you're playing Russian roulette to the prospect of succeeding of having had a life. Mm. I mean, you don't have a life to accumulate, accumulate anything. You have a life to learn how to let it go, to learn how to lose with eloquence, with panache, easily. MashaAllah. That, that's very beautiful because it counters the, the normative culture of uh, you have to accumulate and the capitalist society in that sense. But I wanted mm -hmm. to scope it back to the conversation on uh, work excellence. With regards, to, right. and I want to ground it with an example. So, for example, right, if please. let's say you are an, you, let's say you're a single mother uh, out there and you have four children recently di divorced, you know, you have this idea of role strain. You have expectations from work for you to perform and perhaps climb up corporate ladder. At the same time, you have work, uh, rather they call it informal work or things that you have to do at home with your children. Mm -hmm. How does someone in that position still cultivate this work excellence? Be in this role strain. There's actually, I'm, I'm so feeling there's two, there's two uh, levels to your, your, your to your question, um, and 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 I'm going to, I'm struggling for a distinction between them. But the one is is kind of like, there's a pragmatic, with how do I deal with working? So the actual activity of doing work, cleaning yes. the house or whatever. Yes. You know? And there's a second problem, and that is this issue of role. You know, I mean, so, which is a social, it's, it's a social issue. It's my social contract. Yes. I have a role as an employee, as a role of a, as a mother. They're actually two different problems, actually. And they, and they, 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 they so I'd, I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to explore them separately. Sure, Sheikh, bismillah. And, and so, so let's just deal with the, the, the practical, um, the practical problem of doing tasks of do of working. Okay. Consistent with the intent to take is that you focus on outcome. 
because you just want to get the thing that you're trying to get. Yes. When you shift your intent from taking to giving, okay. what you're doing is you're shifting your attention from outcome into process. Mm. You're not just trying to get to the outcome, the thing that you're getting. You're actually trying to do what you're doing in order to do it well. Now, there's many things that we do for the pleasure of doing them, not just to get to the outcome. And that's actually got nothing to do with the activity itself. It's got something to do with how your attention calibrates around doing it. So, people who have weight problems, I mean, I'm not trying to beat anybody, people who have weight problems. Well, a person with a weight problem normally doesn't actually enjoy food. Strange, it's a paradox, but they don't. Why? Because they're just trying to get it all in. It's like they're trying to get to the end of the meal. They're not actually savoring mm. the meal. Interesting. When you savor the meal, you eat to eat well. You put all your attention on every single step of the gastronomic process, from biting to, you know, if we're Muslim, you feel the texture of the food, you, you, you the, the aroma, the taste, every, you know, kind of, you chew it properly. You, that's a whole different experience of eating. Then you actually enjoy the food, you know. So, an example is the man's walking up the mountain. So, you look at the person from the outside and you're looking at him just walking up the mountain. And you don't have the tools to interrogate his intent. You don't know what's going on in his consciousness. So, so to, to, to have the tools, let's assume now you get introduced to what's going on in the person's mind. That person can be walking up the mountain in one of two ways. Okay. In the first instance, which is how most people would do this, he's walking to get to the top of the mountain. In other words, the action activity of walking step by step by step is the price he has to pay to get to the top of the mountain. And when you do anything in that spirit, what I'm doing is a price that I'm paying. There's a feeling of loss. There's a feeling of drag. It's debilitating mm. and it's exhausting, actually, to get there. Yes. Another man, same mountain walking up the mountain looks at the, from the outside looks exactly the same but now you go into his ear and you look at what's happening on the inside you're suddenly realizing actually this guy really likes walking hmm. but he, he needs a good he needs some kind of an objective otherwise the walk isn't challenging enough so he needs the top of the mountain so he's walking but the top of the mountain is his means to walk well so the first man is walking to get to the top of the mountain the second man is using the top of the mountain to walk well. Mm. There's a shift in his attention from the top of the mountain, the outcome, to the process, the actual walking. The purpose is the walking. Now, this guy's experience of walking is completely different. It doesn't exhaust him. It's not something that he experiences as onerous. It's something that actually is pleasant. It's something that, that nourishes him, doesn't exhaust him. So... Your lady with the four kids. Doesn't matter what it is that she's doing. She still has a choice as to whether she's going to shift her attention from outcome into process in any given task that she's doing. And when she does that, that task will no longer exhaust her and deplete her. That task will nourish her. Inshallah. That's true for anything. Right. So, so that's at the level of the task. You know, um, uh, then there's the level of role, which I alluded to before. Yes. You know, it's, it's tragic that we have this. I mean, why does this person have to juggle these various roles? Because to earn a living to, you know, so she, the, in fact, not just she, our whole society has agreed that she won't be provided for unless she does all of this stuff. So there isn't a provider. Mm. The, you know, you know so she has to do, you know. Well, actually, that's the disease. The reason why carrying all these things is such an exhausting prospect is because she doesn't feel that her life is supported by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her, her life is... Is, 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 is she has to do her life. She has to make this thing work. 
That's an exhausting prospect because any human life is too complex to make work. Mm. You can't make your life work. I can't make my life work. It's too complex. And the, the, the reason why we have to believe is because otherwise our lives are just distressingly exhausting because they're impossibly complex. She, this woman's from a, a disease that she's not unique in the disease that she's suffering. Every human being suffers from exactly the same disease. And the disease is this bizarre notion that we can make our lives work. Mm. That we can actually earn our keep. You can't earn your keep. How do you propose to earn your keep? You, how do you propose to, to, to pay back the account of all the ingenuity that's made the, the chemistry of your liver possible? Mm. You can't earn your keep. You, you, you're, so, you're so beyond debt. You, it's not up to you to make your life work. Your life Inshallah. works. And it's precisely the assumption that makes her life work, that her life works beyond an ingenuity which is her own, which is the real security that makes all of this burden tolerable. But the idea that I have to make my life work, that my life is fundamentally dysfunctional, it's cost and scarcity, and I've got to work myself to death to get it, that's the thing that consumes you. And that's the thing that consumes her. The hustle culture that right now, if you're not productive, you're seen as lazy or incompetent in society. Is this culture healthy? Uh, what, what can we do to respond to such? So, um, <clears throat> You know, you know, you know the, the, obviously, Fionn, the, the problem is partly that, that, that um, it depends who you're talking to. Mm. So, so, I think for adolescents, it's very healthy for them to get a fire under their tails and to realize that actually they have to get up and start serving the world. Mm, that um, that a life on the couch is not a life worth living. And life in front of the TV is not a life worth living. Mm. And, um, and the problem is that, that, that when people kind of, people uh, at that period of maturation in their life, um, uh, hear that, hold on, you know, um, I shouldn't, I needn't have a, a conscience about not working. I mean, in my experience, that very often doesn't bode well for the person or, in fact, for the, 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 the kin group that have to support this, this, this person. Um, so so the, the, the problem is that we make that way of looking at things a one-size-fits-all, that we sort of think that this is the human condition. We have, as we mature, we have different engagements with work, mm. you know, and 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 so so, um, uh, you know, the, the, without work, you cannot transcend the fundamental narcissism, and um, and laziness that is implicit in being an an adolescent. You know, and and so you have to the, the society has to put a virus in your head, and the virus has to say something like, "You don't live for yourself." You've got to fend for your family. You've got to make a contribution. The problem is that we think that that's an end state. It's not an end state. It's it's not a destination. It's a way station. Mm. <laughs> because that you know that should shouldn't last you a hell of a lot further than your forties. Because hopefully in your forties you start to realize, but you know um, uh, I've worked myself to death and they're still ungrateful. Mm. Um, oh. And the price has been too high. And, you know, and, 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 and actually they've just been using me. And what mm. about me? So, you know, every person's midlife crisis has actually got that question spiked through it. What about me? What about me? That's a very appropriate question to ask at some point in your life. And because that then starts to create the, an interest in doing this sort of inner work that you can withdraw from being productive and start to get an insight into how things really work. This withdrawal is, 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 
is kind of is also the process that's necessary to discover that your life works despite your ingenuity or despite mm. your interference. But oh. if you, how are you going to discover that if you didn't interfere in the first place? In other words, if you weren't struggling with the prospect of making your life work and failed at it, how are you going to discover that your life works despite you? Mm. Mashallah. So, so, so one must be careful not using, it's not a one size fits all to the problem you're describing. Yes. Because young people have to swallow the pill you're describing. They have to. They have to understand that they've got to go and earn the money to make old people like me possible. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's very beautiful how you describe the idea of hustle culture. And um, interestingly, you also mentioned that it's not just about, uh, you know, making money, but it's about giving. And um, I mean, as young people, we are raring to go, you know, you have this um, desire to want more, perhaps at a fast pace. Um, I would say, would you say that having elders or the guidance and wisdom of mentors uh, would help perhaps channel this energy in a more uh, mature way? Well, it depends what they what they advising you to do. Because I, I, I can think of a lot of old people who would advise you to make more money. Um, who would literally advise you not to follow a career path that would satisfy your heart, but to follow a career path that would satisfy your bank account. So, so, I mean, just because the guy's got a great beard doesn't mean to say he's got any sense. You be very careful who you take on as a, as a mentor. Mm. Age isn't a criterion alone. I know lots of really stupid old people that I, I, whose advice I wouldn't give two farthings for. Mm. You see, you, uh, so somebody must, you, you, want to have the, you want to have the mentorship of somebody who suffered enough to know is failed enough to know. Mm. That's my I'm plan. You, you want to have the mentorship of somebody who's failed enough to know that you can have all of the money in the world and still be a miserable being. Find it a miserable experience being in your own skin. Mm. You know, that, that the real pleasure of being human isn't, isn't to gloat over the size of the bank account. It's, it's actually in the quiet cup of tea done with a spouse on the veranda or the um, or looking at the sunset on your own. That's what it, then, then, then the best in you comes to the fore. The best of the human experience comes to the fore. Or dare I say the, the, the quietude in sajda. Mm. Inshallah. So, so yeah. and a lot of old people haven't understood this. A lot of old people are quite happy, are quite happy for you to to expend your life uh, in things that are going to give you no nourishment at all, that are just going to make you miserable and empty and quiet and, and unhappy. With regards to this, uh, Sheikh, uh, perhaps we can, uh, uh, you know, it's related. Um, how do you see spirituality in this whole framework of work excellence? Because, you know, we've spoken about you becoming a more uh, mature individual at workplace as an employee and how you can focus on your intent to give your attention on the journey and not the destination. We spoke about that. But I, I guess a question that, that looms is how do we incorporate spirituality in work excellence? So the, the real product of the working is the worker. Mm. Sure. The reason why you work, I mean, so, so yeah. there's, there's the one who's doing the working, there's the work itself, and then there's the product of the work. And then there's the money, which is the product of the work. Now, the further along you go on that continuum, the worse, the more unhappy your life becomes. So if the, you're only working to get the money, well, then you should go to your doctor and get some antidepressants because your life is miserable. Yeah. You could say, no, 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 it's not about the money. I'm working, the money is a sign. Actually, I'm working because I know that the products that I'm delivering to the world is of service to other human beings. At least your intent is benign. 
It's still depressing, you know, but it's a little bit closer to you. It's not that far removed. You could say, every time I work, I am I, 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 I'm really fascinated with doing this job well. In other words, what is it, what is it, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, it's an artisan, like a, sh a cobbler. You don't get them anymore. The person actually makes shoes. Right. You know, you know, how must the stitching be? And how, what is it, what do I need to do to get a really beautifully turned out shoe? So yes. my attention now is no longer even on the guy who's going to wear the shoe. It's on making the shoe well. Mm. Then you get a guy who says, actually, even the making the shoe well is an excuse, is actually a tool to get my attention completely rooted in the moment and not on the outcome. So I'm using the shoe making as a means to cultivate my attention. So in other words, the shoe making is not the product of what I'm doing. The shoe is not the product. I'm the product. My attention is the product. So the, the f closest you pull the, the purpose of your work in, yes. to the, the, the more your, your, your life becomes spiritualized and the more your life becomes innately fulfilling. You know, there's no reason why your work should not be in a practice. Mm. And I, I mean, I experience that in my work all the time you know i have a, so one of the things i do is i teach part of my you know and i can tell so so and i have had this in my life that you know you, you you've started the, the business is young you a young person you really stressed about um earning a living for your family and you really need to not upset the client and you need to you know really um Make sure that you, you, you get the client so you can get that, the contract paid at yes. the end of the month. Man, your life is miserable. Mm. Your whole life is a suffering you have to endure to get to that payday. Mm. Mm. Then you start to realize that, you know, it's an amazing thrill when people walk out that room and you can see that something, their eyes have changed. You know, that's an amazing experience. So, and, you know, you do that well enough, then they'll pay you. I mean, the pay is so, you know, you don't worry about the pay. You can put that off because, it's, you know. But then you realize, but hold on, you know, this, this thing of making their eyes sparkle, the reason why their eyes sparkle is because this argument works really well. This way of deploying the process works really well. So it makes yes. absolute sense that they see what you say. Yes. So now you, your attention is no longer on the sparkling eyes at the end of the day of training. Your thing is now really rehearsing that argument and then suddenly you realize you know i could be as so i can be rehearsed to the point of being able to do this in my sleep if i walk into that room and i've just had an argument with my wife and 20 percent of my attention is still stuck in that fight i'm going to mess this thing up so yes actually it's not even about getting the argument right it's about being absolutely present in the room when I walk into the room oh. and my work is and when I'm doing that I'm using my work as a way to be here be present be available to what my rabbi's being then my life is a permanent Disneyland it's just a party I, shall I have the choice I can either my life is either something that exhausts me or my life is something that nourishes me it's got nothing to do with the activity you could be a cobbler you could be well, I'm not too sure about a banker, but certainly a, a consultant or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I understand. Che, it reminds me of this quote. It says that uh, if you do work that you love, you'll never have to work another day in your life. And then this whole idea of, um, you know, you're, you are the product, you're enjoying the journey. Um, maybe perhaps it also reminds me of a very common I question. Yes. I, I need, I'd like to interrupt you there, Abu Sufyan. Yeah. I? Sure. Bismillah. There's a wonderful Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song from, the, from my generation, from the 70s. Okay. Uh, um, and basically the line is, if you can't be with the one you love, love with the one you're with. Mm. That's beautiful. 
So do you understand how that relates to the thing that you've just said? I mean, so if you, you know, if you can't, I mean, you want to be the concert musician, but man, it's not going to happen. So love what you're doing for heaven's sake. <laughs> Learn to love what you're doing. Mm. Don't just do it in order to get paid. Even if you're flipping burgers, that can be a way of being conscious. Just do it properly. Mm. Sorry, I interrupted you. No worries, uh, Sheikh. Um, yeah, I'm also reminded of this other quote. It, it says, you know, life is not the number of breaths that you take. It's not measured by the number of breaths that you take, but rather by the moments that take your breath away. You know, by the same thread, you know. So I would say, yeah, I really connect with whatever you mentioned. And I think it's very beautiful, uh, the wisdom that you're sharing. Uh, I have another scope that I wanted to explore. Uh, inshallah, Please. you will benefit. So, um, you know, this whole idea of climbing the corporate ladder, right? The idea is that as you pick up the titles, you become all the way perhaps to the CEO, you have more freedom. So the idea of freedom. <laughs> that it, how true is this? Because we have this notion that if, if I it's work fun. hard enough... Oh, absolute lie <laughs> that if i have the Some the title people, you know i have more time you know people i know are ceos of big corporates yeah i mean just consider this all of your colleagues at your level at the, in the corporate are jealous of you okay because you're the one who's you know and 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 not only are they jealous of you but they're all very clever people and they're all mean and they're all trying to get, so, so you start off with that. I mean, you're in a sea of sharks, you know? Mm, okay. Now you've hit a crisis like this. Your enterprise is about to collapse because of the coronavirus or something. Yes. Who do you talk to? Who helps you? If you, the further down the hierarchy you are, there's somebody else you can, you know. But if you're right at the top, if you're pinnacle of this thing, who, you're on your own. All of the, all of the physical, um, uh, you know, accoutrements that go with the, with the position, like the money or whatever, um, uh, uh, you, You know, if if you if if you're so distressed, drinking um, you know a really refined cup of tea, that at the end of the tea you haven't actually tasted the tea, then what's the use of having the expense of tea, mm. or the expense of yacht, or the expense of anything? If you're in hell while you're sitting there because you're concerned you might lose it, and you've got all of these responsibilities for all of these people, so how you know the, we set up this illusion that the wealthy and the privileged are happy. Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, that really is my first-hand experience. In fact, there's absolutely no relationship between our privileged people and how happy they are. Sure. There's almost an inverse relationship because the, mm. the less complex your life is, the easier it is to become happy. So, so you know, it's a miserable thing that young people kind of put you know, they have this thing in their minds that getting to the top of the, you know, getting that this is, it's worthwhile. It's always in, inadvertently, I mean, you know, invariably rather, it is, it is always a, a chalice of dust. It, ha, it just, in fact, it's worse than that. It's salt water that you're drinking for thirst. It has the opposite effect that you think it's going to have. Inshallah. Yeah, uh, I think it's a very common misconception. Uh, I think we all go through it. Uh, I, you, there's a quote that I think I read it in uh, the care and growth model. It says that mm. nobility is not acting above struggle, but nobility is actually being patient in it. And how I would try to understand that, you, this quote, nobility is not acting above struggle. Nobility is being patient in it because some people will be like, uh, you know, or oh, I, you know, they are not going through the struggle that others are going through. So they are better. I'm better than you because I'm not going through the struggle. But this quote really flips it on the, the head. And it says that it's about the process, about your attention, and about being patient. Perhaps you can expound a little bit more, Sheikh. 
Yeah, but that's exactly, I mean, you've, you've summed it up completely between the eyes. It's, you know, it's exactly that. It's not, everybody's going to suffer loss. Everybody's going to uh, have, everybody's going to die. So everybody's going to lose everything. It is the fortitude that you, that you in, exhibit when you're dealing with that catastrophe, that's your mark as a human being. You know, um, there's nothing else that matters. How big the bank account is, the yes. how many cars, that that's all going to go. It's not. It's not your. It's the point we made before. It's not your eloquence in accumulation that means anything. It's your eloquence in loss. Patience in adverseness in adversity is actually exercising eloquence in loss. Hmm. Interesting. But, but that's a struggle, isn't it, Sheikh? The whole idea of, you know, I, I don't want to go through this. Why is this so difficult? You know, they call it beautiful patience. Is that perhaps why they call it? <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. No, I mean, look, we all, we, all, we all want to shake our fists at the sky when we stub our toe. I mean, it's like that. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, we're kind of, we're human. Um, uh, um, and, and also to have a sense of humor about, about your own impatience, you know, that kind of, because otherwise it just becomes too difficult. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, so I, I guess, I guess partly what I'm trying to do with my life is to convince people that they're taking the wrong thing seriously. And, 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 and that there are things to oh. take seriously. But what you really should take most seriously is what it feels like to be in your own skin. Mm. And what it feels like to be in your own skin should actually be a pleasant experience, a deeply pleasant experience. It's designed to be a pleasant. He didn't design for you to be anguished and have all of the blood chemistry that's associated with misery. That's not how he designed you. He designed you the opposite. He designed you to be in ecstasy. You know? Mm, mashallah. And that, that's the real product of a, well, of a life well lived, is a person who's completely comfortable in their own skin. It's a pleasant experience being themselves. That life throws adversity, grenades, whatever, with a smile and a grateful heart, they can roll with a punch. They're not knocked over by things, you know. Subhanallah. So, so, so anything that sort of starts waving a moral finger at you, I mean, that's designed to make you feel bad. Don't buy the. Don't buy it. It's nonsense. Because you don't owe it to anybody to feel bad. A lot. You don't owe it to a lot to feel bad. You, know, you owe it to yourself to feel good, and you feel good. You have a sense of appreciativeness and gratitude for your life. Everything else comes right. Everything else comes right spontaneously. Would you but say if it's... you think you need to do all these things to have that experience of feeling good in your own skin, you'll stay mm. miserable. Subhanallah. Would you say they, they, they talk about this uh, dichotomy between the, the mindset of abundance and scarcity? For what you just mentioned, it reminds me that if you are full, uh, in a sense that you feel content, contented in your own skin, like what you mentioned, you always be pouring out rather than you're exactly. expecting people to fill you up. Exactly right. Exactly that. Yeah. And, and, and not to feel full is to do violence to the truth. Not to feel full is? Is to do violence to the truth. Because not to feel full means to say that there's a lack. Not to feel full means to say that it's inadequate. Not to feel full means to say that you've been done in at some level. Well, none of those things are true. I mean, because your life, or has to get you to this point, your life has, has uh, demonstrates the most astonishing complexity and um, and sort of generosity by everything that isn't you to make you possible that should make you realize but hold on you know g gratitude means i recognized i've received in excess of my due that's what it means to be grateful mm. now any human excess being who does not recognize that they've received in excess of their due is doing violence to the truth because every human being no matter how oppressed you think you are have received wildly, incalculably in excess of your due. And once you recognize that, then you occupy the place of abundance. Mashallah. You occupy the place of scarcity. When you say there's not enough to go around, I better go and get what I need. 
Mm. And that is based on false on a false view of how things are, because you've already received, you know, enormously more than what you could ever repay. Perhaps uh, alluding to this, it's about the journey. Uh, T. S. Eliot mentioned this quote. He said that um, uh, he said uh, at the end of the day, um, he spoke about exploration, right? this idea of journey, that. Um, uh, we must never cease in exploration, right? And at the end of the day, uh, is to return to a place that we once were, but know it for the very first time. Hmm. Would you say this is why the journey matters? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's the fundamental sim symbolism behind the Tawaf. Hmm. You know, why? Over and over and over, around the same... Because... It's not the object that changes. Wow. The observer changes. And because the observers change, the whole universe has changed. If I change the, the lens, one. then everything that I see is different. I ex inhabit a completely different universe. In other words, perspective, right, Sheikh? Mm. And growth. Um, there, there is something uh, that I'm reminded of. Uh, is by uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. He said that... Uh, if a man were to really know who Allah is, he would be facing afflictions, a smiling man. Mm, and exactly. I, I think it's very beautiful. It's related to what you uh, said. Hmm. That has to be true. That has to be true. Hmm. Um, would you say that, uh, you know, if, if a person is at work, right, uh, this whole idea of work excellence, and they don't have a certain set of joy, or, or on their face, they always look so depressed. Is that a sign that something is wrong in the way that they're looking at it? Because we uh, need the, some litmus, litmus test. Yes, yes. I mean, I mean so, so that's a good place to start. But, but obviously, the, the best place always to start is not with somebody else, but with yourself. What does it feel like to be in your own skin? Mashallah. You know, so, so uh, mm. I, I mean, are you looking at the clock? whenever you knock off with a sense of joyful anticipation that you're now getting off the hook. Mm. And are you, you know, th thank God it's Friday. Is that true for you? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, you know, is that, you know, uh, is your, do you find your day-to-day -day working life onerous? Mm. Do you think that you experience that you're not being paid enough? Do you experience that it's all too hard? Do you, that, are you being exhausted by your day-to-day -day life? That's, the, you know, it's not what somebody else looks like. It's what you feel. That's the only thing that really matters. I mean, you got, he's going to, that other person is going to die their own death. You're going to die yours. So, so the issue is to crack the code for yourself. MashaAllah. I mean, I suppose that's fundamentally why, and I'm, this is a very contentious thing to say, and I, maybe I'll deny having ever said it, but... <laughs> I suppose this is why fundamentally people of Tasawuf make bad revolutionaries. Because it's not about changing the social order. It's about the individual. The real revolution is where N is equal to 1. And that 1 is you. If, more, if enough people do that, the social order just spontaneously changes. It cannot, but it has to. This is beautiful, Chef, because uh, now you're not just talking about work excellence, which is the topic we were talking about today. That growth ultimately is about the revolution of your soul, your own inner inner being. Mm. And, and Chef, I wanted yeah. to ask you about this topic of authenticity. Because mm. there's a lot of uh, talk right now, you know, about being authentic, being your, your truest self. And you also mentioned uh, in your books about writing in a journal. The idea that you have to be present in the moment and you, quote unquote, do the inner work, mm. right? How important is it? And, and what are other ways other than journaling? And maybe you can share a little bit more about journaling and perhaps other ways we can be in tune with our own selves or authentic, authentically. Yeah. I'm very really nervous of that word. Mm. Because the criteria, the expectation it sets is so high that it makes 90% of us feel like we're frauds. 
Allah. So, so uh, the, I, and and I only, you know, I'm, I'm, so, so if I think about the, a professional context where a client is saying, you know, I mean, we need authentic leadership. There's always a, an element of the sort of almost clumsy, um, sanctimonious. So, you know, I really don't like that word. Mm. Because the, the problem is that we're all inauthentic. Oh. We're, we're, all, we're all busy with the shadow show. I mean, that's, we're, we're struggling to get clarity. And in fact, the clarity is so difficult to, main, to produce and to, 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 to achieve that to round on any human being and to challenge them that they're inauthentic will be true. Mm. Wow. You know, so, so it's, it's a, I think it's a really clumsy weapon, the charge of inauthenticity. Um, uh, you know, so, so I, the reason why you journal is to clarify your intent. Hmm. Cla if we say clarify your intent, it means that your intent is by definition kind of mixed. It's kind of gray. There's some light in there, there's some dark in there. And so there's a, there's a measure of inauthenticity. There's a measure mm, of it. Measure. And it's a measure that you need to struggle with and clarify. You don't really ever get to the outcome of that process. That's what you've got a life for. So really the only authentic human beings are called corpses. There the inwardness and the outwardness are exactly aligned. There's no, you know, so, so, you know, if Tassawuf means anything at all, it has to be something beyond just a clumsy, sanctimonious kind of uh, uh, moralism. Hmm. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, Chef, thank you so much for all the wisdom. Uh, um, we've you. come to the end of the session, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you. Thank you. It's very delight to speak to you as well. Uh, and uh, may Allah grant you good health so that uh, we can Ameen. benefit from the wisdom and the lessons Ameen, and all the classes. May Allah bless you, Sheikh. Thank you so much thank for everything. You. Inshallah, we, we, nice you. we hope to feature you again, Inshallah. Ameen. Shukran. Ameen. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. Take care, Sheikh. Thank you.